Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. How are we doing? Are we awake? Are we alive? Are we ready to go? How many of you were hardcore and you made it to church last week? Raise your hands. Oh yeah, I can see the grit in your teeth. Look at you. Man, way to go. Way to make it to services. We were down in Cedar Falls learning and growing together as well as just kind of retreating and uh, kind of talking about the year to come. We've got a lot ahead, don't we, guys? God's got a lot ahead for us as a church this year, and we're really, really excited uh, to see uh, exactly how it all pans out. And uh, guys, uh, before we jump into the message this morning, we're going to be jumping back into this series uh, uh, called More Than a Feeling on Emotional Maturity. Um, but before we do that, I do want to um, kind of talk about what we've got coming up and, and, and kind of key you in on um, one small change that we decided to make as a staff and as a leadership team. And so uh, as I do that, I would like us to give Stephanie Williams, my beautiful wife, a hand. She comes forward. Can we do that? Um, guys, I know she's my wife, and I know that makes it easy for me to brag on her, but, my, but Stephanie... Um, spends every single Sunday back in the kids' area with your children. And she pours her heart and soul into all of them and, uh, man, is very, very passionate about what's going on back there. And, uh, guys, I'm, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for her, and I hope you guys are too. And in the next year, we're, we're going to be seeing, seeing a lot of different changes that are going to uh, uh, pertain to not just this church, but her kids' ministry as well in a number of different areas. Um, uh, but uh, the thing that we want to key in on right now is, is three services. Everybody say three services. Okay, so we're doing three services. We talked about launching those three services in February. However, we as a staff, uh, we're talking about it on Tuesday, and, and as far as recruiting and training and getting everybody in place in order to get that third service off the ground, we realized, you know what, it might be wise just to wait another month. And so what we're going to do is this, and it, it's actually kind of perfect, okay, because on March 3rd, we're going to three services, okay? So on the third of the third month, we're going to what? Three services. So three, three, three. It kind of works out perfectly. I think the Holy Spirit's in it. How about you? Right? Uh, so it's gonna, we're going to push the three services just back to March for that reason. Um, we need more. We're, we're, we're still working on recruiting and training and getting leaders raised up. and really excited about that. But what I thought it would be a good idea to, to do today is we continue to try to recruit for that third service and get some of you to step up and help out. Um, I thought, you know what, they don't exactly know what they're getting into. Right, And so I thought it would be awesome to have Stephanie come up here and kind of share a little bit of her vision for kids' ministry as well as exactly what we're asking from you if you're willing to step into this role. So uh, you have the floor, my love. Oh, good. So we both are long-winded, so I'm sorry. But my daughter's currently, actually this is amazing, my daughter's currently leading games and kids' ministry right now, so I hope she takes a little bit extra time. Um, my vision for kids' ministry and what I've been, my heart's cry is that we see bridge kids become bridge students, become bridge members. So that is the heart and soul of it, is these generational kids come up and they have bridge DNA and they're growing into what it means to be part of the bridge and going out and interacting with their friends. And I love to see when kids on, kids on Sunday morning, on Wednesday nights, they bring their friends because they're so excited about what's happening in our kids' ministry, ministry in order to pour out into their friends. And I, I love when kids are like, yeah, I told my friend at school like they should come on Sunday mornings. I'm like, that's so cool that our our kids are tiny little missionaries in their schools. There is no better way to empower the next generation by that equipping them and sending them out into their schools, into wherever they hang out. Um, your part, your part is not as babysitters. Your part is not as coming in and filling a void. That, this is something I'm super passionate about. 
Amen. You are part of a team. You are part of building up the next generation. You are part of equipping and teaching other kids what it means to follow and love Jesus. So it's not just sitting in a Sunday morning in a chair in a room making sure that kids don't kill each other. That's super important, too, but that's not what your purpose is. Definitely don't want kids killing each other in our church. That's, Listen, they've tried. They've I don't tried. want to deal with the paperwork, right? Yeah, it's a lot of paperwork. Like, nobody wants that. There's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is essential that you are pouring into the next generation. There's probably someone in your life. I know there's someone in my life who affected me from a little age to know who Jesus was. It wasn't my family. It wasn't my family. It was someone in a church who took the time to get to know me, to understand my story, and understand how much I needed love and care and affection. And if you can do that, if you can love somebody else, if you can pour out into somebody else, that is who we want in kids' ministry. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to be a great communicator. None of that stuff. You have to first have love for somebody else. You have to have Jesus in your heart and want to share that with other people. And sometimes it's chaotic, and sometimes it's crazy, but most of the time it's fun. So that's kind of the vision behind what we want for volunteers. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's phenomenal, and that's super exciting. And something that I thought was really cool that Steph and I have been noticing, because we're about eight years in as a church, guys, and what we're starting to see is we're starting to see some of the kids that we had in youth group come back to church, or we see some of these kids that were in kids' ministry. She was just telling me the other day uh, some of the kids' songs started coming on the radio or something. I forget what it was. We, we randomly started singing one of the, the Fruits of the Spirit. Most of the kids who've been through our Wednesday night program know Fruits of the Spirit. Which we're going to be talking about today, which is kind yeah. of phenomenal, yeah. right? Uh, and so, like, the kids that, like, are in our youth group now, they'll hear that song, and then they'll just start singing it, and they'll know that they'll know it by heart. And, and the reality is this, guys. Um, um, a big reason that you're in church today, you may not realize this, but a big reason that many of you are in church today is because you went to church as a kid. Right, and, and whether you left the church in that point in time or, or, or you never did, the reality is, as you got older, you sat there and went, you know what, I know where my anchor is. Right, I know where I can find safety. I know where I can find love. I know where I can find Jesus. And, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that many of you in this room were raised in kids' ministry, which should tell you something. As a matter of fact, your kids are 85% more likely to stick with Jesus when they get older if they're in church on a regular basis as children. Does that make sense? And so that makes kids' ministry vitally important. Amen? So, so here's the deal. That sounds like a huge responsibility, but the reality is it's, it, you're just there to love kids and to help them walk, walk towards Jesus with you, okay? Because here's the deal. As you teach these kids, as you walk alongside these kids, you're going to learn and grow yourself, which is awesome. Um, and and on, on top of that, like practically, in certain, depending on which department in we're not, you're, you're in, we're not going to be asking for a lot. So, Stephanie, why don't you talk about like, hey, if you serve in this department, we're asking this of you. If you serve in this department, this is what we're asking of you. Yep. Um, go ahead and give us the, All right, the details so on that. This is going to shift. He's going to talk about this a little bit in a minute. Um, but pre-K and nursery, we're asking for one service once a month. If you can do two services, I will love you forever. But one service once a month to sit with children, to sit with, to teach a lesson to the preschool kids. So, it's, yeah. so, so time out. Let me just paint this picture for you. If you serve one service once a month, we, we hold how many services on a Sunday right now? Two. And we're going to go to three. So, so if you serve one service, you still get to sit through a service, right? It's not like you're missing out. You still get the opportunity to sit in service. Okay, yeah. go ahead. And then kids' ministry is a little different. We serve one month on, one month off. We want consistency in the teachers with the kids because of the program. Um, so we serve one month on, one month off. Uh, we do need small group leaders, and we do need a couple more large group leaders. So if you feel like you're gifted in speaking in front of kids, I would love to talk to you. Um, so, that yeah, just one month on, one month off. Uh, small group leaders are essential because those kids – get to know you, and they get to know your story, that kind of stuff, so that they get to have that connection point. Like, I love when Miss Stacy's in the classroom because she plays bingo with us every Sunday. She brings bingo in, and the kids have toys. I'm so sorry if there's ever whistles in there. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, but those kind, of, those kind of stories, they get to know you, and they get to appreciate you. It's amazing having those connections with those kids over time. It's good. Okay? So, guys, uh, this is what we want to encourage you to do. We want to encourage you grab a red card, Okay? 
if we're going to go to three services, we, got, we need all hands on deck. And so I don't have one in front of me, but as you go to the Welcome Center or next to the, the, um, the sound booth, you'll see the different cards. You'll see the blue card for new, newcomers. You'll see the green card for life groups, and then you'll see a red card for serving men. Uh, do us a favor. Spend some time thinking and praying about serving in the kids' department over the next uh, 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 little while. It, it, it can be a trial period. You're not stuck in it if you do it. Thank you, guys. Um, if you sign up for it, you know, maybe it'd be like, you know, what, I'm going to try it for three or four months and see how it goes. Um, man, it would be a huge blessing to us. And, and not only that, guys, this isn't volunteering. This is serving in the Lord's kingdom. Amen. Um, and this is helping the next generation know Jesus. And so um, uh, it's not about volunteering. I heard a, a pastor say this last week when we were at leadership retreat. He said volunteer. The word volunteer is a swear word in our church. Um, we are serving the kingdom of God for, for eternities to come. And so, um, guys, uh, I really want to encourage you to consider that. Can we give Steph a hand this morning? All right. And then, one, lastly, many of you, as you walked in this morning, you probably saw a bunch of tape on the floor um, uh, as you walked in over by the nursery room, okay? We are going to be making some changes to our nursery and pre-K department, and we want to let you know about that, as well as ask you to maybe give a little bit over and above your tithes and offerings towards that effort. Um, this is what, what we're realizing. Our kids' rooms are way overpacked. We're growing at a, at, at a pace that we cannot keep up with in our facilities, and so we're making some changes in those departments, and this is what we're looking at. Um, our goal is to create a cry room for moms. Come on, moms, can I get a hand for that? We're going to need a cry room for moms. Okay, we got one mom that's excited about that. It's good. Um, we're going to create a cry room for moms where we're going to, um, if you have a, a baby that is one year old or younger, um, and most moms we're finding don't take their kids into the nursery department until they're at least a year old. So what we're deciding is we're going to create a cry room with a TV that's going to be streaming the service. And if you come to service and you're struggling with your baby here in service, man, you can go to that cry room and not miss a thing. You can continue to watch service, breastfeed, do whatever you've got to do to help um, serve your child as we try to serve you as well, okay? But then our two rooms here, we've got the nursery room and the pre-K room. We're going to actually take that nursery room and we're going to expand it to double its size out into the lobby. And the reason for that is, is because we're going to take our pre-K department and split it in half. And we're going to take all the kids that are potty trained and walking and put them in one room and all the kids that are not potty trained and, and maybe walking in the other room. And that will enable us to create more space in our, in our room so that we don't have a giant zoo running around, okay? Uh, and, and kids tackling each other and playing uh, uh, better football than my Packers did last night. Anyway, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, anyway, uh, guys, we're really, really excited about this nursery expansion, but we do need you to help give towards it. Um, we we uh, did some. We got some estimates put together. It's going to cost somewhere around nine thousand dollars to pull this thing off. So if you're willing and able to give to this, please do so. Um, drop a check in the offering box. Give online. It's really easy to do, man. Um, uh, it would be awesome, awesome, awesome if we could not have to hit our budget too much as it pertains to this expansion. We've got all these great things going on, and I just want to see God use it for his good. Amen? Amen? All right. I got all the deets out of the way. You guys want to pray and get in the word? All right, let's do it. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this awesome opportunity. We have to worship you this morning, Lord. Um, God, thank you for a church that's so generous. Thank you for a church that continues to give. God, thank you for um, uh, people that continue to show up to worship you in this gathering, in this place. And Lord, we just pray that it would all be to your glory. It would all be to your name. And God, that our focus would never be on the people in this room, but would always be on the people that are not in this room. God, that our focus would always be on the empty chairs in this room, that our focus would always be on the lost that don't know your son Jesus, that are on a highway to hell, to use the, the song um, lyric, God. Um, every single person we meet, Lord, on a daily basis is either on their way to heaven or they're on their way to hell. And, and God, I want that to weigh on us as a church um, in a way that presses us, that presses us, to give generously towards this ministry, but to also live lives that help others know Jesus. And so, Lord, as we try to get to know Jesus more this morning and his desires for our lives, may we get out of the way. May your Holy Spirit move in our hearts and our minds. And, God, may you move in a powerful way that changes us this morning as we leave this place. It's in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said... All right, guys, like I said, we're jumping back into our series on emotional maturity called More Than a Feeling, and uh, we launched this series a couple of weeks ago, and, and when we launched this series, we actually quoted an, a, a famous Christian author by the name of Pete Scazzaro, and, and, and he kind of set the basis for this whole series in 
when, when he wrote these words. He said, it's impossible. Everybody say impossible. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And as we look to be more like Christ in everything that we do as followers of Christ, we need to understand the importance of our emotions as well as, uh, excuse me, as well as the need to live in self-control. As well as the need to live in self-control. You see, emotions are important. They're, they're what make us unique from the rest of creation. They're signatures of the uniqueness of our souls while they can also rise up from the baggage of our flesh. I love that line. They're signatures of the uniqueness of our souls while they can also rise up from the baggage of our flesh. They're important. God gave us emotions for a reason. And the mistake, the mistake as we think about self-control would be to think that we need to do a better job at stuffing our emotions down. But that's not what emotional maturity looks like. Emotions are like signposts in the ocean, right? I used this example a few weeks ago. They let us know where good things are, but then they also show us where danger might be lurking just around the corner or even in our past. And too often, we overcorrect as it pertains to our emotions. We either stuff them down, which will inevitably lead to the potential to explode, or we just let them run rampant, destroying anyone and anything that might get in their path, ourselves included. Our emotions are powerful things, aren't they? They're extremely powerful things. And in all this to say that in order to grow in emotional maturity, we first must realize where emotional immaturity comes from. And I've come to the conclusion that emotional immaturity is almost always rooted in having the wrong identity, misplaced desires, and an undiscovered purpose in life. In that order. Emotional maturity is almost always rooted in having the wrong identity, misplaced desires, and an undiscovered purpose in life. In that order. Too often we place our identity in the wrong things, whether it be because of something that was done to us, or how we were raised, or maybe even something we did to ourselves. Our identity isn't something um, uh, other than God and the risen Christ of whom we are called to place our anchor and identity in. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the most frustrating things about having your anchor in the wrong place is that when it's in the wrong place, it doesn't work like it should. Right? Anyone that knows me knows that I'm a fisherman, right? And the easiest place for me to fish in Charles City is in the Cedar River, right? It's in the Cedar River. And when I'm fishing the Cedar River, I always, always, always have to deal with something called current, right? Because the river is always moving. It will never stop moving. There, if you ever tried to stand in a river current and like tried to like push back against it, it's not easy, is it? Especially when uh, it's moving quickly and you're, you're, you're waist deep. Trudging up that current is not an easy thing to do. And, and keeping a boat in place is not easy to do either. Um, but then there are even days where not only am I dealing with current as I'm sitting there fishing on the river, but there are days where the wind's also blowing on me as well. And I've got this trolling motor that I'm trying to use, but sometimes it's not powerful enough to fight the wind and the current and to deal with all the things that I'm dealing with. And so sometimes in order to get on top of the fishing holes that I want to get on top of, I have to what? I have to drop my, my anchor. Now here's the thing about the river. The bottom of the river is almost always changing. And so dropping your anchor doesn't always mean that you're going to catch something. And too often, I get so frustrated as a fisherman because I'll go to drop my anchor and it'll land on a soft bottom. Or to land in soil. Or, or, or to land somewhere where, where there's nothing for it to catch onto. And, and what happens when that, when that anchor doesn't catch is I begin and my boat begins to move out of my control. And it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. The same is true in life, guys. Too often, we place our identity. We place our anchor in the wrong places, in the wrong things. And when we don't have our anchor in the right place, we get out of control. And when we're out of control, we begin to fall for things that we weren't meant to fall for. And, and we desire and lean into desires that are not good for us and, and are not fulfilling for us. Desires that only create more chaos and destruction in our lives and even in the lives of those around us. Emotional mature, immaturity, guys. Emotional immaturity is almost always rooted 
in having the wrong identity, which then presses us towards misplacing our desires. That's what I want to talk to you about today, are misplaced desires. Can, can I be vulnerable for a minute and, and give you an example of this in my own life? Because as your pastor, my anchor, my identity is in Jesus, but sometimes, sometimes I drop that anchor in the wrong place and that anchor slips. I might drop it close to Jesus, but it's not always firmly planted in Him like it should be. And when the storms of life come crashing in, too often my desires slip from healthy things to unhealthy things. What does this look like practically? Well, instead of leaning into prayer and trust in God, I let the stress and anxiety of life push me to look for an escape. How many of you have done unhealthy things to escape the pressures of life? Come on, raise your hands. Right? Unhealthy things to escape the pressures and the stress and the frustration of life. And for me, it's a number of different things. It can be doom scrolling on my phone. It can be getting lost in television or a Netflix series or even a video game. I begin to lean in desires, into desires that aren't exactly healthy for me. Now, am I saying those things are bad in and of themselves? No. I'm not saying that, but... But when they become a consistent escape to the point of addiction. When social media becomes something that you are constantly, constantly seeking and looking at. When you're looking for that shot of dopamine as you look at those comments and likes you got on that one post that you've been thinking about all day. When, when you get home and you immediately get sucked into a TV series because it's so much easier than dealing with stress. When it's easier for you to go hide in the garage than deal with your marriage and work on your relationship. When, when you're using things as an escape or, or, lean, or you're leaning into them to the point of procrastination or to the point of irresponsible decision, they, they begin to negatively impact my life and yours, and they're no longer good. And then they no longer are the desires of which God has placed inside of us. You see, because when they become those things, they become desires of the flesh, and they don't lead to life. The Apostle Paul the man who wrote a majority of the, uh, of the letters in the New Testament, wrote about this progression of emotional immaturity in his letter to the church in a place called Galatia. And that's what I want to talk about today as he also offers us a solution to this problem. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is where we're going to be at this morning. Galatians chapter 5, if you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, as always, I want to gra- encourage you to grab one of those black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. Um, um, if you do not have a Bible at home, man, take one of those Bibles with you. That is our gift to you. Okay. If you're joining us online, though, and you don't have a Bible at home, we do want to encourage you to get in the Word with us. We're going to be um, uh, in the book of Galatians chapter 5, and we, you, can all, you can download an awesome app called Version. That's Y-O-U version. And it's a great way to read scripture and share it with others. I typically don't like to encourage people to get into the Bible on our phones because our phones are uh, really distracting. So, guys, if you don't have a physical Bible that you're bringing to church on a Sunday morning, I'm harping my kids about this right now, right? Hey, guys, where's your Bible? Are you bringing it to church? No, I didn't get it. I was reading it on my phone, right? I was reading it on my phone. Get a physical Bible, Um, especially especially if you're a, a firm believer in Jesus Christ. You should have a study Bible. Okay, if you want recommendations for that, let me know. But today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and we're just going to read the, the whole chapter like we typically do. Um, uh, uh, and the reason for that is because there's a progression that we see here that I think relates to our situation, um, but then also leads us towards um, what God calls us to as it p- pertains to our desires in life. Okay, So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read the whole chapter and break it down together. You guys ready? All right. Nobody's ready, but that's all right. Y'all are like a library this morning. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Drink a Red Bull or something, Carrie. My goodness. Okay. Verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 
Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to you, excuse me, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the law. You are trying to be justified by the law. You have been, uh, excuse me, by the law. Let me start to start over. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await the faith, await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I love that verse. You were running a good race. He says, who cut on in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works its way through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm preaching circ- circum- if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I being, still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Okay, what is Paul getting at here? Okay, what he's saying is it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, right? And what he's dealing with in this passage is he's preaching to a bunch of of, uh, Gentiles, okay? So if you don't know what a Gentile is, let me ask you a question. Are you raise your hand if you're Jewish? Congrats, you're a Gentile, okay? You're a Gentile if you did not raise your hand because because that, that was the difference. It was Jews and Gentiles. They were the, that's how the, the by, in biblical times they separated each other. Okay, so he's preaching to these Gentiles who have just been grafted into the covenant of Jesus Christ. Okay, in other words, it used to be under the Abrahamic covenant. It used to be like the people of Israel, the Jews, like they were God's holy people, and it was them and them alone that were set apart. Right, but then Jesus came, and he opened it up for all of us. Praise God. Amen. Because Jesus opened up the veil and he did all that he did when he died on the cross, he made it possible for everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone to know who Jesus is and to follow him and to be one with God again someday. What a privilege, amen? Okay, but here's the deal. Now that these Gentiles are beginning to follow Jesus and getting to know the Old Testament as well as the new, the, the new law, right, the old law and the new law, What's happening is these Jews are going, listen, as Jews, we were circumcised, and that's what set us apart for Christ, or what set us apart for the Lord. And now that you're a Gentile, you also need to have circumcision among your men. And all the men went, hooray. Right? But Paul here is going, no, 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 no. We don't hold to the old law because Christ brought in the new law. We don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore. We don't have to do all these slaughtering. We don't have to do all these burnt offerings. We don't have to do all these things because Jesus was the one offering that took our place that that we might defeat Satan's sin and death and be one with our king again. Amen? And so he's dealing with this situation. He's saying, listen, listen, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the old law. As a matter of fact, I'm so irritated with these guys. I wish they would just go the whole way and cut the whole thing off. You can let that go where it needs to go. Okay. What's he saying as it pertains to our series? Your identity needs to be in the right place. It's for freedom that Christ set you free, not so that you could be enslaved to the law. That's why we're a come-as-you-are church. That's why we're not one of those churches that says, take your hat off when you walk in these doors. Respect the Lord. That's why when you walk in these doors, we don't make you put on a suit and a tie because we believe that there there is no law that enslaves us to those things. We believe there is one law, and that is Christ's law, and it is for freedom. Everybody say freedom. Freedom that Christ has set you free. And some of you, when we launched this series a couple weeks ago, you realized, man, I am not free. 
I've got some real things that I need to deal with, and I need to start placing my identity in Jesus who set me free. Because, because if you don't have your identity in the right things, then, then this happens. Let's continue to read. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire law. In other words, all of the Old Testament. Every single law you could ever read or know or memorize is summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, so I say, and here's the key. Walk by the... Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, so there's our desires, right? You're, some of you guys are like, when are we going to talk about desires, Rob? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh, however, are obvious. In other words, if you're not following the Holy Spirit, it's easy to see. If your desires are misplaced, it's so easy to spot. Everyone knows it, even if they're being Iowa nice and not saying it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Man, Paul just swung the axe there, didn't he? But the fruit of the Spirit. Man, if you just key into Him and start following Him and his guidance, if you just start desiring what he desires, here's what's going to happen. Love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let me say that again. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. In week one, I asked you an extremely key question that I think Paul hits on at the beginning of this chapter, and it's this. Where, where, where is your identity found? And is your anchor in a place that provides you with freedom? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You shouldn't be enslaved to the law, nor should you be enslaved to your flesh. If you're following the Spirit, if you're doing everything you can to key in on Him who is the Holy Spirit and looking to Him for guidance, you find freedom. Paul says you were called to be free. You were called to be free, but if you want to be free, you got to know where your identity is found and you got to have your anchor in the right place. Give yourselves to the Spirit, Paul says, not to the flesh. Give yourselves to the Spirit, not to the flesh. Let me ask you, what have you given yourself over to? Last week I asked you where your identity is found, but, 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 This week I want to ask you, what have you given yourself over to? Because the acts of the flesh are obvious. And no matter how many people are or are not talking about it, we see it. Let me ask you, let's just walk through this passage for a minute. Because if your life is in chaos, you you maybe are giving yourself over to the wrong spirit. I'm not saying that your life is in chaos. That's always the answer. It's not always because of your sin. But sin causes chaos because God is a God of order. God is a God of order, so if your life is in chaos, it's either for His purpose or your sin. 
So, so, so let's just walk through this passage. Paul says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. How many of you are living with your boyfriend or girlfriend? How many of you are having sexual relationships outside of wedlock? How many of you have a sexual relationship outside of your marriage? Oh, yeah. It happens. How many of you are living with impure minds and impure spirits? How many of you are, are, are diving into pornography? How many of you are lusting after the flesh? How many of you have taken God's design for marriage and, and blown it up into debauchery? How about this? He goes on. Idolatry and witchcraft. Oh, I'm not a witch, Rob. I'm not doing wizardry. I like Harry Potter, but... Right? The last few years, uh, as a pastor, one of my biggest struggles has been watching people get into these, like, crystals and stones and all these, like, things that aren't painted as sorcery, but they definitely are. I'm sorry. Some of us put a little too much trust in oils, <laughs> right? Um, how many of us are... Uh, have, Man, man, my what are they? What are the sun signs called? I forget what those are called. The astrology. They're paying attention to astrology, and I'm a Pisces, and I'm a Taurus, and I'm all right. Like, you realize that's that's witchcraft, right? Like, that's how many of you have had a Ouija board or, or tarot cards in your house? That's idolatry and witchcraft. Anything outside of the Word of God is. It, it, is an act of the flesh. How about this? How about this? Some of you guys are like, well, those are really dark sins, Rob. I'm not about those. Well, what about hatred and discord? How many of you have that one person that, man, when they're just even in your presence, they make your skin crawl? How many of you, everywhere you go, you just happen to not get along with everybody? You're the problem. How many of you can't keep a job? Because everyone's just so unfair to you and nobody understands. How, how many of us are, are living in jealousy? How many of us are angry because she got pregnant and I didn't get pregnant, ladies? How many of us struggle to be happy for others Happiness. I'll tell you what, I had a hard time being happy for Niner fans last night. Am I right? <laughs> Let me tell you. I had to apologize to Justin Murphy because I didn't want to give him credit for the win. I'm like, we beat ourselves. You guys didn't deserve to win that game. How many of you struggle to be happy for others? I'm being serious. Well, they got this car and they got this great job and they got the promotion and they got this and they got that and that's not fair. How about dissensions and factions and envy? How many of you are prone to gossip? How many of you are prone to divisiveness? How many of you are prone to, to picking sides? Drunkenness, orgies, and the like, he says. Now, we go really far when we think of orgies, right? Like We're like, that's a dirty word, Rob. I can't believe we're talking about that in church, right? But if you actually look up the definition of orgies, it was, was scary, okay? I was nervous when I did it. Some things are just dangerous to Google, y'all. It says this, such parties were wild, alcohol-fueled events featuring all sorts of lewd behavior, excessive eating, drinking, Wild dancing, sexual immorality, sometimes part of the worship of pagan gods. Can, can I just read the beginning of that definition again? Such parties were wild, alcohol-fueled events featuring all sorts of lewd behavior, excessive eating, and drinking. A football game. I'm not saying we'll go to a football game is a sin, but I'm saying what behaviors are you giving into? No, I'm not going to watch Stop Walks to Football. What are you, crazy? 
Okay, 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 okay. Now, now, I want you to go back. Let's, let's, let's take it back here for a minute. We're going to wrap up. I'm sorry. I know I'm taking forever this morning. I apologize. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I want you to look at that list again. And I want you to think about somebody that you believe is emotionally immature. I mean, they're just out of control. Let's, let's just read through that again. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. They have all kinds of relationships, and they can't keep one. Idolatry and witchcraft. They keep trusting in things that, man, we've told them over and over to stop trusting in, and they're not going to work. If anything, they're going to lead down a bad path. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, Factions, man, they're always arguing with everybody. We can't get them to own their mistakes. They're out of control. They can't own their own stuff. They're extremely insecure. They get defensive whenever we have any conversation with them uh, that, as it pertains to any conflict. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The acts of the flesh are not the marks of, of an emotionally healthy or mature individual. And not only that, but Paul says that those who show these acts of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while also remaining emotionally immature. And this is what Paul's getting at here. He's saying, it's good for you to try and do the things God wants you to do, like circumcision and all these different things. Like, that's great that you have that desire to do what God wants you to do, but that's not what God's calling you to. He's not calling you to just do what he wants you to do. And for, as a matter of fact, he wasn't even calling them to circumcision. But this is, this is the bottom line here. The bottom line is that Following Jesus is not about simply doing what God wants us to do. It's about desiring what God desires. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like if you truly want to have a deep, soul-filled relationship with Jesus, you can't just do what he calls you to do. You have to desire what he desires. So let me give you an example. Kids ministry. We're looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to help out. But here's the deal. We're not just asking you to fill a hole. We want you. I had Stephanie come up here and share the vision for kids ministry because you need to see what her heart desires because I believe that's what God's heart desires. God's heart desires for our kids to know Jesus. He desires for the next generation to take over the church and to take it over well and to hold fast to his word and to know that his love is never ending and never failing. How many of us would say, I want my kids to, 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 to know that, right? That's what God desires as well. So we're not asking you to just go serve in a kid's department. We're asking you to desire what God desires and do what God wants you to do because of what he desires. Because he desires for those kids to know Jesus. He desires for the next generation to take over the church. He desires for the future of his kingdom to prosper for years and years and generations and generations to come. Following Jesus is not simply about doing what God wants us to do. It's about desiring what God wants us, excuse me, it's about desiring what God desires. Because, because when we place our anchor in Christ and we desire what God desires, excuse me, when we desire what God desires, our hearts change. And when our hearts change, then our hearts become broken for the things that break God's heart. They become joyful for the things that bring God joy, and they find peace because they know that God, that the God of the universe is in control. No matter what may or may not be going on around us, if we could just look to desire uh, what God de desires instead of compromising or questioning what God desires. If we would just seek out and submit to the Holy Spirit and do all we can to keep in step with Him. If we would just give up the desires of the flesh that are so obvious and begin choosing the Holy Spirit and submitting to Him and looking at things from God's perspective and Jesus' perspective rather than our own, then the fruits of the Spirit would only follow. Then, instead of fits of rage, we'd find joy. 
instead of a desire for sexual immorality and impurity, we'd find out what true love actually is. Instead of dissensions and factions and envy, we'd find community and family. And I'm not just talking about church acquaintances. I'm talking about real family. I've got people in this room right now that are sitting in these chairs that I view as family. That I would live and breathe and die for on a daily basis. That actually care about me as much as I care about them. That want to celebrate my wins as much as I celebrate theirs. If we would just desire what God desires, then instead of emotional chaos and instability and immaturity and strife, we would find chaos, we would find peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Many of us, you can start playing Adam, many of us are out of control. Because our identity is in the wrong place. We're sent pushed our desires elsewhere. Where God never intended them to be. And, and today, it's time for us to start asking ourselves a few questions as it pertains to our desires. So let me just leave you with this. I want, Just like the first sermon, I'm going to leave you with three questions that I want you to take a picture of or write down if you're taking notes. If you have time, I'll try to leave them up there as long as I can. But the first question is this. What unhealthy desires have you given yourself over to? Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't be, don't be ashamed of your sin. That's not what God's trying to get you to be. He doesn't want you to live in shame. He wants you to feel the guilt, but He wants you to submit to Him that you might change. But you can't change until you know what's wrong. Amen? So, so what unhealthy desires have you given yourself over to? And, and, and the goal of this isn't to simply do the right things. It's to desire what God desires, right? So, so, so let me ask you this question. Instead of, hey, um, what do I uh, need to start doing? Let me ask this. What will you do this week to start submitting and listening to the Holy Spirit? Sanctification is a process. It's something that takes a lifetime. Sanctification, the process by which we are made holy. Okay, it's a big word, sanctification. It happens on a day-by-day-by-day-by-day by day by day basis. I'm being made holy day-by-day, day, just like you are to be made holy day-by-day. Day. But what do you need to do to start listening to the Holy Spirit so that process of sanctification can get rolling? And then lastly... Paul said, we've crucified the desires of the flesh. We've crucified it. We've killed it. We've hung it on a cross and said, no more. So what in you needs to be crucified? Where have you questioned or compromised God, God's commands rather than submitted to them? Where have you said, well, yeah, we might be having sex outside of wedlock, but it, it's okay. God knows that we truly love each other. and you know, We're married in God's eyes well, I know smoking's not good for me, but man, I just, it's my stress release, and if I don't, I'm going to kill somebody, and I'd rather smoke than kill somebody, so. You know, I think God would understand, this person's just horrible, and it's okay for me to not talk to them at work, because I can't stand them, and I'm going to blow up on them if I don't. You're harboring bitterness, and you're making excuses for it. Well, I know that, you know, this is dishonest as far as my taxes go, but, you know, it's, it's okay because, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to give some of it to, the, I'm going to tithe it to the church, so it's okay for me to cheat the government. No, the Bible says give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Or maybe we take it the other way. You know, I, after I get all my bills paid and everything, I give a little bit to the church. Like every, every week I give a little bit to the church. God says, give of your first fruits. Emotional immaturity is not only a bad thing, it pushes you towards misplaced desires that lead to your destruction. So I think it's pretty important that we ask these questions this week. And more
more importantly, ask the Holy Spirit to make change in us as we look to pursue Jesus with our whole hearts. Amen?